Bahari approved. Federal government revises 2020 budget in response to impact of coronavirus pandemic. Central Bank of Nigeria announces additional 100 billion naira as aid towards managing health crisis in the country. Pump price petrol. On Tuesday this week, health authorities in Lagos announced that a Nigerian woman who arrived from the United Kingdom four days earlier had tested positive for COVID 19. Indeed, Kinsley, you know, prior to the UK returnee, only the index case and another who had contact with him had tested positive in Nigeria. However, just yesterday, five new cases of COVID-19 were announced, increasing the number of confirmed cases in Nigeria to eight. That's right, uh, Jumai. Now, a statement by the Federal Ministry of Health indicates that of the five new positive cases, three came in from the United States of America, while two arrived from the United Kingdom. Yes, Kinsley, and information has it that two of the three from the U.S. are Nigerians, a mother and child. This revelation makes the six-week-old baby the youngest COVID-19 patient in the country. The land border have also ushered in the third case, who is an American national. He becomes the first COVID-19 case linked to the Nigerian border. Accordingly, the federal government has announced a suspension of the visa on arrival policy and restricting entry into the country from 13 countries, including the U.S. and the U.K., as part of measures to curb the spread of coronavirus in Nigeria. Other countries on the list include China, Italy, Iran, South Korea, Spain, and Japan. Others are France, Germany, Norway, the Netherlands, and Switzerland, all of which have over 1,000 cases in their domain. Well, this, of course, is in addition to an earlier directive to public and civil servants to share official travel plans outside the country for now, while advising private citizens to equally rethink their travel plans. And the federal government is also urging public health authorities of countries with high burden to conduct diligent departure screening of passengers and advise their nationals to postpone travels to Nigeria. Well, Nigeria is a matter of urgency, it's been suggested, needs to also ramp up the protection of our over 200 million citizens and uh, prevent the coronavirus from taking a foothold in the country. Already, the Lagos state government has announced that as part of its preventive measures against the spread of the pandemic, the state government is shutting all public and private schools effective Monday, the 23rd of March, as well as banning religious gatherings of uh, persons 50 and above. In other words, of 50 persons and above. Now, with the pronouncement of the travel ban and other precautionary measures already taken by the government. The question still is uh, just the effectiveness of these measures. And uh, many countries, of course, we know had already shut their borders and uh, making several attempts to try to contain uh, the virus within their own uh, territories. But, of course, uh, it's uh, a case that Nigeria, of course, is coming on to the stage now, considering that uh, we are having instances of persons with the virus streaming in from abroad. This, of course, will form the crux of uh, part of our conversation this morning as uh, we'll discuss the coronavirus travel restrictions and matters arising therefrom. My name is Kingsley Osadolo. Welcome to Good Morning Nigeria. And I am Juma Yusuf. It's always a pleasure to welcome you to Good Morning Nigeria. We are reaching you live in Abuja on the network service of the NTA. Our second topic for this morning will focus reduction in pump price and we have as usual the complementary segments of Good Morning Nigeria, newspaper review, business and orders. The news highlight is next with Comfort Amadou. Good morning, Comfort. Good morning, Jumei and Kinsley. Here's the uh, news highlight. Uh, President Mahmoud Buhari has approved the immediate reduction in the pump price of petrol from 145 naira per litre to 125 naira per litre. 
Minister of State for Petroleum Resources, Dimitri Silva, announced this at a media briefing after the meeting of the Federal Executive Council. The President has graciously approved that the pump price of petrol should also accordingly drop. So the pump price of petroleum uh, of petrol will be from now 125 for now. If there is any further drop, it will even drop further. We are introducing the, a price modulation mechanism which will allow the price to drop or rise with the rise in crude oil prices so that our people will not just take the brunt of uh, this crude oil uh, price drop, but also get at least some benefit from it. And in compliance with the directives of the Minister of State for Petroleum Resources on premium motor spirit pricing, the Nigerian National Petroleum Corporation has reviewed its ex-coastal, ex-depot and NMPC retail pump prices accordingly. Effective today, 19th March 2020, NMPC ex-coastal price for PMS has been reviewed downwards from 117.6 per litre to 99.44 per litre while X depot price is reduced from 133.28 naira per litre to 113.28 naira per litre. The reduction will therefore translate to 105 naira per litre retail pump price. A statement by Group Managing Director NMPC Mele Kolokiari says, said despite the obvious cost implication of this immediate adjustment to the corporation to the corporation, NMPC is delighted to effect this massive reduction of 20 naira per litre for the benefit of all Nigerians. And accordingly, all NMPC retail stations nationwide have been directed to change the retail pump price to 125 naira per litre. Meanwhile, President Muhammadu Buhari has approved a number of critical measures towards sustaining the nation's economy in response to the negative impact of the coronavirus pandemic on the global economy well-being. One of such measures is the reduction in the size of the approved 2020 budget by 1.5 trillion naira by 1.5 trillion naira. And Minister of Finance, Budget and National Planning Zainab Ahmed announced this while briefing journalists at the end of the Federal Executive Council meeting presided over by President Mahmoud Buhari. Enhancing uh, production to make sure that at the minimum the 1.8 million barrels per day that is in the budget as production volumes is realized and NMPC has directives to, to that effect that we also need to adjust customs revenue, which has been budgeted for at 1.5 trillion, uh, but we're adjusting it downwards because we anticipate that trade volumes will reduce. And once trade volumes reduce, customs revenue will be significantly uh, impacted as a result. The Central Bank of Nigeria has further ramped up its support to the economy as the effect of the novel coronavirus continues to affect all aspects of life around the globe. Governor of the CBN, Gov Godwin Emefili, says the additional 100 billion naira is to aid health authorities develop instant solutions and prepare for any major crisis ahead. As of today, crude price attained unfortunately a level of $25 per barrel. First, the CBN is directing all deposit money banks to increase their support to the pharmaceutical and healthcare industries. A total of six patients, including the index case who tested positive to coronavirus, are being managed at the mainland, mainland hospital, Yaba. Lagos State Commissioner for Health, Professor Akin Abayomi, disclosed this to newsmen in Lagos. is located in Ekiti, and the other four are located in Lagos, but all of them are being followed up by the state public health officials and supported by the Nigeria Center for Disease Control. Sorry, that uh, was an update uh, by the Minister of Health on coronavirus yesterday. 
Uh, Senate has cancelled, called on President Mahmoud Buhari to address the nation on the dreaded COVID-19 in the country and to set up a special intervention fund for tackling the scourge. This followed a motion by Senator Denjuma Goji, which also urged the federal government to urgently establish testing centers in all the states of the Federation. And the Senate also advised federal government to shut down all airports in the country except Namdi Azikri International Airport, Abuja, and Mutala Mohammed International Airport, Lagos, for easy monitoring while all Nigerians coming into the country from high risk countries be quarantined by government against the initial self isolation. To underscore the gravity of this matter, even if the president comes out personally himself and address this issue, I yes. think Nigerians and citizens. Nigeria, Nigerians will take this matter more seriously. Meanwhile, Lagos State Government has banned religious gatherings of above 50 people to further curb the spread of COVID-19. And the Senate has called on President Mahmoud Buhari has called on President Mahmoud Buhari to pass a wide range of resolutions towards preventing the spread of the coronavirus disease in Nigeria. Lawmakers at plenaries suggested... ...one cap for. For surface cleaning, for first aid, for your laundry, in your bathing water, and to protect your family from up to 100 illness-causing germs. Be Dettol Show. You're watching Good Morning Nigeria, reaching you live on the network service of the Nigerian Television Authority. Now it's time for us to take some business stories. And here is uh, our correspondent, Ronami Girani. The global crisis caused by the coronavirus is forcing Nigerian business owners to rethink their growth targets for the year 2020. With closed borders, reduced consumer demand, bank loans to repay, and almost non-existent credit lines, capital market investors have urged banks to ease the access to credit for the sector by reducing the cost of credit to micro, small, and medium enterprises in order to cushion the effect of this global pandemic. Meanwhile, the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa proposes intra-Africa trade as a way to mitigate the rapidly growing economic insecurity caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. As Africa's major trading partners struggle to contain the effect of the coronavirus on their economies, an opportunity to deepen continental trade has presented itself. Director of the ECA's Regional Integration and Trade Division, Stephen Keringi, insists on the need for the continent to urgently implement the African Continental Free Trade Agreement, as the intra-African markets could help mitigate some of the negative effects caused by COVID-19 by limiting dependence on foreign partners, especially with regards to basic food and pharmaceuticals. The African Continental Free Trade Agreement is set to commence in July 2020. The coronavirus pandemic is also affecting the almighty gold, which is no longer a safe haven for investors as the precious metal defies market rules and continues its downward spiral, experiencing its worst week in 40 years. Gold, which is normally seen as a reliable store of value in times of uncertainty, is trading at over 2% below Monday's value at $1,499 per ounce. Now let's head to the floor of the stock exchange to see how markets fared yesterday, the 18th of March, 2020. With business news, I'm Ronami Egirani. Thank you so much, Ronami, for that business package. Up next is Newspaper Review. Review by our two base with us on the studios uh, for today's uh, review session. By your good morning and welcome. Thank you. Good morning. 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 Good morning.
to 125, with rider, diesel, kerosene also affected. You find that story on page two. And um, the board health lines there, amid five new coronavirus cases, FG bans flights from US, UK, 11 others, and cancels visas on arrival and other visas. You find that story on page six, 40 and 41. With a rider, Northwest governors to close school for two weeks. Lagos bans religious gathering of more than 50 persons. And the picture story there, you see National Youth Service Corps members leaving the camp in Kubwa, Abuja, following the suspension of national orientation exercise by the federal government over coronavirus yesterday. And um, just below the masthead, at the bottom plate of the Daily Sun newspaper, federal government cuts 2020 budget by 1.5 trillion naira with riders hinges benchmark on $30 per barrel and stops recruitment. Two doctors, district head, 13 orders die of Lassa fever in Bauchi. Find that story on page five <coughs> and page eight. Insurgency, Nigeria at war. That's coming from the Senate and calls for land aerial bombardment of insurgents. You find that story on page six. Jump releases more UTME results. That story is on page three. Okay, let's take a look at the uh, punch news about the front page is pretty busy. So uh, right from uh, above the nameplate right to the bottom, let's say above the nameplate, oil price sinks to $24, lowest in 17 years. NNPC reduces petrol pump price to 125 naira per liter. FARC meeting ends in deadlock over revenue remittances. And federal government slashes budget by 1.5 trillion naira and reduces benchmark to $30. Two earpieces uh, beside the nameplate, uh, reps summon a mere fillet and ex-mint bosses over eight year on audited accounts. JAMB releases another 450,000 UTME results, that's page 12. And uh, lead story says mother, baby and three others test positive as cases rise to 18. That's of course uh, obvious reference to coronavirus. Uh, the number of riders there, American contact of AKT uh, case dies, Nigerian companion tests negative. Government faces tough task, traces 800 contacts. Northwest and Quara close schools, and Lagos and Ogumban gathering of over 50 people. Lagos state government shots, uh, Lagos state government schools, uh, well this is, uh, says LASG schools short. It would appear to be Lagos state government schools only. Mm -hmm. But the uh, closure order is actually for both private and public schools. Uh, so let's say Lagos state government uh, short schools. Uh, then the photographs of the NYC there suspending orientation and discharging core members. That's on page 23. Bochi uh, local government polls hold in June after 13 years. NCDC recalls nine Lassa fever deaths, 51 new cases. Um, two die in Plateau Well and rescue are injured. And then, of course, you have the other headlines there. But the CBN has uh, also announced, that story is there right at the foot of the front page, CBN announces 1.1 trillion naira intervention fund to boost the economy. Bio. Well, the stories in the newspapers are all dominated by uh, coronavirus. And Nigeria has recorded five new cases, bringing the total to eight. Uh, Nigeria has confirmed five new cases. Three or four of the cases are in Lagos and one is in Ekiti. Of the three, three uh, of the five, three came from the United States. There's one that came from across the border from Benin Republic. The two others are a Nigerian mother and an infant of six weeks old, have been the youngest to be infected by the coronavirus. The two others also came in from the United Kingdom and they are all Nigerians. Uh, for now, the concern is that the Minister of Health has enjoyed all to be calm and not to panic. And therefore, we should entrust the competencies of our health personnel uh, who will apply all possible scientific measures to try and advise and check the, uh, the spread of coronavirus. In Kasina, the Commissioner for Health, Kabir Mustafa, has also announced a suspected case from Malaysia. 
uh, the person who is suspected uh, to have been uh, for malaria presented with diarrhea. He had attended a conference in Mal Malaysia. They are expecting results from the test. Across the state in Kano, three suspected persons have also all tested negative. So far, we now have eight reported cases. And if you look at all, of all the eight cases, you have just one coming across the border. All the others came through uh, flies into the country. Throughout, uh, there's also the indication that the lady who came, came through from United Kingdom was suspected to have coronavirus, traveled from Lagos to Enugu uh, through Oweri, apparently has been reported to have died. You recall that she was tested and she was negative to coronavirus. The indications are that she probably uh, gave up uh, the life from underlying sickness, but this has not been confirmed by the Ministry of Health. Meanwhile, measures are now taken uh, across the nation to check the coronavirus. Already, travel ban has been placed on 13 endemic countries. These are countries that have reported cases of more than 1,000. Visa on arrival has been suspended. No foreign trip is to be approved for government officials. Uh, the president has also approved the reduction in the pump price to 125 Naira. And the interesting thing about the pump price is that Nigerians trust them. They rushed to filling stations yesterday and said they are waiting for their engineers uh, to adjust the pump price. Actually, it will take, it's supposed to take effect from today. But you remember, anytime there has been pump increase, pump price increase, it has always been automatic. But whenever there have been a reduction, it is always, they are always slow to co uh, comply. Lagos has restricted uh, religious activities beyond 50, and the NYSC has terminated orientation what was going on at camps across the country. It was the, the orientation where were in their first week. Also, Northwest governors gathered at Kaduna and they were joined by their counterparts from Niger and Kwara State, and they have ruled that with effect from Monday, all schools are to close in the state. And this is very instructive in the sense that we are already approaching the Easter holiday break. Yeah. So all they need to do now is extend the Easter holiday break and then ensure that when they are to resume, they resume earlier so that the, the time that has been lost due to the, the corona closure of schools mm -hmm. can be regained back on the other way. Now, 2020 budget is also affected. Uh, the Minister of Finance, Budget and National Planning announced the approval of 1.5 trillion to be uh, to be sliced from the budget 2020. The recommendation has been approved by Mr. President. It was announced after the Federal Executive Council. Uh, the capital project so, will suffer a cut of about 20%. Uh, guideline has been sent to ministries, departments, and agencies about how they will adjust that. You recall that the budget was 10.59 trillion, and the oil benchmark, which was $57 per barrel, is now put at $30 per barrel. Upstream activities of the NMPC has now been suspended. Uh, reference projects, by, uh, revenue projection by the Nigeria Custom has also uh, been reduced. It is now re uh, reduced by $1.5 trillion. Uh, across the world, the impact is also massive. Uh, Europe, America, and the Middle East, many of the cities, major cities, have actually been shut down. There are restrictions on inter and intrastate movements, especially in Europe. And the Vatican, as well as the Church of England, has canceled masses and advised persons to worship at home. Saudi Arabia and Iran has also announced a uh, cancellation of group worships uh, in Saudi Arabia. Worship at the Grand Mosque at Mecca and the Prophet Mosque at Medina are to continue. National Assembly uh, is also suggesting that not only should we just ban uh, travel or flights from endemic countries, but persons coming from the endemic countries upon arrival should be quarantined. In fact, the recommendation from the National Assembly is that uh, we should restrict all flights into the country to only two airports, Lagos and Abuja, so that we'll be able to manage uh, scientifically, at least all entries, because from all indications of all the eight cases, only one came through land border. The other seven came through through the airports. Therefore, if we are to track 
and manage the crisis, <coughs> the location should be at the airports. Okay, uh, by, as you said, I mean, you have a raft of issues uh, to uh, discuss uh, this morning in terms of the stories on the front pages, uh, but uh, virtually all the stories are taking their bearing from uh, the coronavirus pandemic around the world and how Nigeria, of course, is, is responding. I, I just want to touch on a few of them. You earlier referenced uh, the, the fall in, uh, in crude oil prices and therefore the consequential a directive uh, for uh, uh, the pump price of petrol to also come down to one around 25 uh, naira per liter. The, effect, the directive is supposed to take effect today. Now, what we would expect to see is that uh, consumers should not be at the mercy of, uh, of, of, uh, of uh, petrol uh, station attendants. The DPR, and now we have the Federal Competition uh, uh, Commission, uh, that's the formerly the CPC, that's the yes, Consumer Protection Council. Yes, uh, Council. Council. yes. They, Council. They, they, they should be out there to ensure that uh, filling stations, you know, comply with this directive. I mean, the intention is not that only uh, NNPC mega stations will be selling at 125. Yeah, you okay. know, the usual alibi will be, oh, the stock we had, we bought it at so much. <laughs> now, assuming the price went up, from 145 to uh, 150 or 185, you can be sure that by this money, of course, there will be long queues, and then they will uh, adjust their adjust their uh, pump uh, yeah, meters, yeah. adjust their pump meters, and they profit from it. So this is another one now. Uh, I mean, you take it. Uh, that's 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 the way. <coughs> High that's the way it goes. Must be part of the Must process. Of yes. but, but let's let's also bear in mind what this means. So as consumers, it's a topic we are going to discuss. So we'll get our our guests to also focus on that. When crude oil prices then rise, and assuming that we are unable uh, to ramp up our own domestic crude uh, refining capacity, it also means that the pump price will also change. Will also so that when, they, when it changes, people will not be saying, oh, this government or whichever government is then in, in force, we say we have brought hardship upon Nigeria. That's part of what we should you know, generally watch out for. I, I don't know whether, you know, uh, uh, not you, these road transport workers, mm. will take a cue from this and also slash transport fares. Because yes. it's a usual alibi. Yes, it's, it's puzzling because when it comes to economy, uh, this is what happens. Already, the indications are that the landing price of petrol is now about 70, uh, 70 naira. Yeah. And I think this will have been a wonderful opportunity to completely elim eliminate what has been called subsidy and sometimes co called undercover, to completely from the petroleum products and let the market <coughs> folks de determine it. Corona has brought us uh, this silver lining for us, if possible, to wash our hands of subsidy of petroleum products. Meanwhile, there are frantic efforts to ensure that the refineries are properly put in uh, performing gear so that they can refine what we consume. Luckily for us, expectedly, any time this year, uh, Dangote's refinery is also expected to come upstream. With all those coming in, then the consequences and necessity for petroleum subsidy gradually should, should fade away. Oh, okay, okay. But I just, just this last point about mm. the response of uh, some state governments, yes. Lagos State, uh, Quara, and the states of the Northwest Zone, they are closing uh, down public and private schools. Uh, I, I think that it, this is necessary as part of the preventive measures, but this also should be done in consultation uh, with some other stakeholders. Now, the uh, WAEC or this SSC exam, or let me just call it WASC as we used to call it in those mm -hmm. days, those exams are due to start sometime in early April or thereabout. So if the schools are closed, are you also shifting those exams? I mean, those exams are conducted by the West African Examinations Council. So I think that this is very important for parents, you know, for the uh, pupils themselves, uh, and indeed for those who are conducting the exam to say, look, uh, what is the implication of you shutting down the schools? Yes, yes those who are in uh, uh, JSS1 or SS2 will not be affected. But if you are in SS3, you have an external exam to write. So how does this affect you? In fact, when the governors of the Northwest met yesterday, the chairman of the meeting, Governor of Casino State, eh, categorically emphasized that. He appealed to examination bodies, NECO, West Africa Examination Council, to take into consideration the situation and also cooperate by adjusting their calendar and timetable for the examination so that the students will not be adversely affected. Yeah, yes. but why hasn't they ought to consult with them and say, look, what, what is the best time for us to do this? Uh, I think that's, that's one of the things that uh, This they coronavirus do. challenge yes. is universal and is also national. If you want some national, why is West Africa all a whole? And Precisely. I'm sure they will, they will be sensitive enough to react to these consequences. Because even the closure of schools is not only in Nigeria. 
across the West African sub region, schools, churches have all closed. Yeah. Yes. Well, they, some of them are closing. Yes. Uh, certainly not all. Mm -hmm. A few of them are still there. Bye, Atribi. Thank you for being here. Thank well, we'll you. See too. you tomorrow. All right. It's Good Morning Nigeria, reaching you the network service of the. All right. Many thanks. To brief for that uh, background, I'm here with us in the studios to uh, discuss the issues on coronavirus, travel restrictions, and other matters arising. Let's uh, welcome uh, once again to our studios Dr. Osage Hanire, who is the Honorable Minister of Health. Uh, Minister, a pleasure to have you with us on Good Morning Nigeria. Good morning. Thank you. Also here in the studios is uh, Dr. Fabian Babalola, who is President, Guild of Medical Directors, and also the uh, Chief Medical Director of uh, Richard Eye Clinic here in Abuja. A pleasure to have you with us on the program. Thank you very much indeed. Okay. And also seated with us is Abimbola Silva, Member Guild of Medical Doctors and Family Health Practitioners, Toro Ben Medical Center. It's a pleasure to have you join us. I Thank hope you. I got that right. You got it wrong. Let's <laughs> also welcome Christopher Otabo, Consultant Orthopedic Surgeon. Thanks for joining us. Thank you it's for having me. pleasure. Him. Thank you. All right. Uh, well, once again, uh, pleasure to have you. Yesterday we discussed coronavirus. Today we're back on coronavirus. It's the hottest topic around the world. Uh, after our program yesterday, the Honorable Minister, we uh, got to learn of uh, five new cases, bringing the total so far to eight. Uh, what is the latest asset this morning? That's one. And secondly, uh, from the headlines we are seeing in the papers, uh, there's uh, a lot to do now with regard to contact tracing. What is uh, the feedback you're getting from the field? Well, the contact tracing is going on. Uh, that means identifying all those who have been in contact with the suspect cases or rather with the confirmed cases and trying to find out uh, where all they have been to. Uh, put them under self-isolation and uh, take uh, samples for testing as the need arises. We have to be very careful to how we use our test kits because we don't have uh, unlimited supply. As at this morning, uh, awaiting briefing because there are tests going on. Uh, each test that is done has to be revalidated before you announce it. You have to confirm it. And uh, by uh, maybe in an hour or two, I will know what has happened overnight. But I know that tests are being uh, done as we speak. It, it would appear, I mean, in the, uh, shall we say, early stages of, uh, of Nigeria recording its uh, own uh, index case, that this tended to have been confined to the Lagos area. And now there's a report coming out of uh, Katsina, uh, somewhere in Dusima, of uh, a Nigerian who had been to Malaysia. Uh, there's also a report uh, from Kano. What else do we know about uh, the suspicion of uh, any of these cases in the northern part of the country? Well, there's a lot of anxiety about uh, the coronavirus. So people who uh, notice someone who's traveled a bit and who has a few symptoms like cough, catar, fever, immediately point him out. Uh, even before Katsina, we had uh, people who were being pointed out in Joss, in Plateau State, in Enugu. So virtually everywhere, people are being um, uh, brought for testing, in, as, as it were. Even in, in Abuja right now, there are some undergoing testing. But uh, not all of them really fit the case definition. Nevertheless, uh, if the reasons are there, we do a testing. Uh, to confirm or not. The case in Katsina is not confirmed. Uh, we are waiting for results. And um, in Enugu, the case there was uh, negative. Um, and, and so we follow that pattern of uh, testing and uh, confirming or not confirming. Okay, we have the youngest child, the youngest now um, affected by the coronavirus. What is the situation of the child? Well, they're in treatment. Uh, the mother and child came in from the United States. Uh, the baby was born there. And uh, the routine um, tests have shown that they are positive to test. Uh, t uh, treatment is going at the infectious disease hospital. There is nothing new from that uh, angle. Okay. Of course, the contact tracing <coughs> is going on. Uh, who received the uh, lady at the airport and where they all went to and uh, the connections they have had since they arrived. How successful so far? It's very intensive. We have had to send two vehicles to support uh, Lagos area. You asked just now why Lagos is so intensive. It's because of the international airport, the uh, highest volume of air traffic into the country. So most people who are coming into this uh, country from various uh, places come through this airport. And that's why our focus <coughs> has been on entry points at the airways, at the airports. Honorable uh, Minister, 
T tell us something. I, I mean, again, this is in terms of, uh, of public enlightenment. Uh, I, we do get reports that, okay, uh, persons who have coronavirus, some of them uh, do get to be treated, and after some weeks, a couple of weeks, it is said, maybe two, three weeks, uh, they recover, and then they get discharged. But it would appear that it would appear that the index case in Lagos, as the Italian gentleman, uh, is still in isolation, undergoing treatment. Uh, his case would appear to have now dragged on for well over two weeks, because up to last night, I was watching uh, the uh, Lagos State Commissioner for Health, and he said the gentleman still had not been discharged. What what do we know about his case now? Well, yeah, he's, he's negative now. He's ready for discharge. Actually, it was oh. reported to me yesterday that he's tested negative. What you do is you continue measuring the viral load and seeing how infective or infectious it can be. So his own uh, took a little bit longer, but he's negative now. Yeah. Okay, although Nigeria has been trying, there's, um, experts have been saying that we should enhance our capacity to detect, isolate, and track all patient contacts and effectively in, enable to curb the disease. Our centers are there. We're getting more new centers. How effective are these centers? to be able to curb the spread of coronavirus in this country. Are you talking about the testing centers? Yes, the testing centers. The testing centers. centers only do tests. You send them a sample, uh, they do the test and give you the result. Uh, in some cases, they work day and night. Will we be but, in any moment in time, maybe in the near future, be told to go for tests even if you've not been you know, affected by it or infected by it? No, that's not. the test is quite expensive, I will tell you that, because the reagents are not uh, easy to come by, particularly with the mop-up going on from wealthy countries around the world now buying up reagents from everywhere. So we are trying to also increase our stock. So we do calculated testing. Mm -hmm. There must be a reason. We must have a good reason. Uh, first, you must have traveled out within the last 14 or, uh, or 16 days. And then you must have signs that and symptoms that are suggestive. So the test will be done. So if you have been inside your house or inside town for the last six months, uh, you are not a likely case. Uh, except again you have had contact with, with a person who has been uh, outside the country. So the, uh, there are questions you ask before you uh, expend your, uh, your test materials. Okay. Okay, Honorable Minister, we'll pause you. Let's uh, bring in your uh, fellow uh, doctor colleagues, you know, who, uh, who are here with us in the studios. Uh, first, uh, Dr. Femi Babalala, who is President Guild of Medical Directors. Uh, we say the federal government has now taken uh, the decisive step of uh, shutting uh, flights and travelers from 13 heavily impacted countries. These are countries defined as those where you have at least 1,000 cases and above. Uh, what's, what's, the, what's your reaction to this move by the federal government? Yeah, I think it's a step in the right direction. As a matter of fact, before the federal government took that step, you may have noticed that the, uh, both the National Medical Association and the Guild of Medical Directors, we had put out uh, statements to the effect that we felt that uh, this was a step that was necessary to be taken by the federal government. And uh, I think, of course, that uh, the federal government also saw that uh, the saw the need to to take that step, uh, which has now been taken, and uh, we feel that uh, that is probably uh, very necessary, because now uh, that we have uh, sort, sort of uh, closed the borders to all these countries with high pandemic uh, disease, we can then concentrate on the cases that we have identified in country, and uh, do. Uh, the case tracing as is necessary and of course also maximize the little resources we have in terms of testing kit and all that. Okay, thank you. We'll now come to Abimbola Silva. Let me talk to the lady now. It's supposed to be ladies first actually. We're getting hit. Eight cases already. Are we, being ma are we managing the situation the way we should in this country? Hmm. Um, thank you very much for the question. I personally, well, this is my personal view. I personally think we can do more um, because even from studying from other countries where, you know, where this, the way this disease multiplies, the way, it, the, way the cases increase, it's almost as if over 48 hours, over 24 hours, some numbers double or, you know, in tenfold increase. So I, I wonder if, we're actually picking all the cases. 
especially since we don't have, you know, unlimited supply of testing kits like the Honorary Mullibat Minister has told us. It's, I still think it's very possible to miss a few, especially since we know that some people actually, I mean, for, even from the NCDC documentation, they said that um, a contact is someone who has been exposed to a confirmed case. Uh, and even if the person, and even within 24 hours of the, you know, of even when the person was asymptomatic. So we're saying that we would only test if the person has symptoms, yet we know that it's possible that the person may not have symptoms and still have the virus. And I know it's because of resources, we don't have enough of the testing kits. So I think on one side of it, it may be good for us to try and see how we can mop up a bit more, get, you know, open the nets just a bit wider. For example, I, I have reason to believe, I mean, I know that the people, some of the um, people that were in the same flight as the third case, a few, I mean, they're being monitored. I'm, they, they're doing a great job of contact tracing. It's awesome the way they find everyone. Wherever you're hiding, they will find you, you know. It's awesome what they're doing. I just personally think that maybe the testing, the net of testing should be expanded just a bit more, especially to anyone that you know, you just have this suspicion. Yes, there's standard protocol based on public health advice and, you know, the things you have to, rules you have to obey. But I just think that because of the fact that some people may actually be positive while being asymptomatic, I think you, we may need to maybe modify some of these reasons or, or criteria for testing to, to just a bit a wider net to be able to catch a bit more. This is what I personally think. All right, uh, thank you. Uh, Dr. Christopher Otaba, from a public health perspective, what's your reading of uh, Nigeria's response to the pandemic? Thank you very much for having me. Um, I'll give kudos to the Federal Minister of Health and the, uh, the C NCDC for a good job so far. Uh, but I, I think that the stage we're in now um, will cause every healthcare give out, anyone who have studied the trajectory over the world to be worried is yes, because if you look at the US scenario, from three cases within three, uh, four weeks to five weeks, it escalated to uh, 8,700 cases uh, this morning and with 100 uh, and over 100 deaths. And I think that we are getting to the tilting point where there may be a lot of cases that have been missed and it might soon snowball into something. And that means that the fight will have to be taken from the NCDC to the hospitals. But my worry is how prepared are we as a country? Nigeria is a low income country and even without the pandemic, our healthcare system is not as strong. What about we will now have inflow of patients? Because the cases can come in exponential numbers. We, we don't seem to be ready on the hospital side. The statistics from the US I followed, they said they have 64,000 ICU beds with about 55,000 ventilators, I mean functional, across Nigeria. I mean, that will serve 300 million people Across Nigeria, I, can't, I don't think we can boast of 500 functional ventilators and maybe not up to 1,000 ICU beds. Where does that leave us as a country? Also, in terms of prevention, um, I don't see much traction in that direction. What would have given me some comfort would be to hear that, okay, the federal government have made uh, arrangements to supply like 5 million, 10 million masks, and uh, N95 masks, and uh, uh, um, hand sanitizers, and even personal protective equipment for the hospitals, because the patients will come to the hospitals. And when they come, are we ready? I don't think so. So even the isolation centers, the treatment centers, the information coming from those areas don't seem to appear to me like we are ready. So the NDC, NCDC is doing its job, the Federal Ministry of Health is doing its job, but should the battle shift from the level of prevention to where you now have community transmission? 
I think that we're going to have a big challenge in our hands in that direction. Dr. Babalala. Yes, I think I agree with uh, Dr. Otabo to a large extent. You will recall that uh, during the Ebola uh, crisis, uh, the, the index case went to a private hospital. And the likelihood that uh, cases will come to private hospitals is very high. As a matter of fact, this is one thing that really worries us, the Guild of Medical Directors. Uh, the Guild of Medical Directors. Um, and when, uh, we, to be honest, we're not ready. Because on our part, we have uh, tried to link up with the NCDC. And uh, we had some uh, training sessions done with them uh, about a week or two ago, both uh, in Lagos and in Abuja here. The training was useful, but at the end of the training, we were not kitted out properly, you know, to handle these uh, cases. I think the hope was probably that uh, the same thing that happened in the Ebola situation, whereby only, we had only one or two index cases, and uh, that was the end of the matter, would be, be the same thing here. But obviously, we see now that we're getting more cases in Nigeria, and like uh, Dr. Bimbo said, the likelihood that we have missed out some cases are also there because the, the testing uh, regime, the testing protocol we have in the country now is that you must be symptomatic and you must have a history of contact with uh, people who came from abroad or you came from abroad yourself before the kit is used on you. Whereas it is possible for you to be asymptomatic and have the problem. So the, the, the I mean, um, the uh, loose area in our protocol in the country at the moment is that our testing uh, criteria is too strict and we need to broaden it. And then secondly, I think that maybe federal government should uh, also take cognizance of the fact that uh, 60 to 70 percent of uh, uh, health care in this country <coughs> takes care in private hospitals. and. Uh, uh, I believe it's good that the Honorable Minister is here. I believe that uh, some move should be made to properly kitting out some hospitals, private hospitals spread out across the country. Maybe in Abuja, take about five, six private hospitals, kit them out properly, give them PP, have a private, uh, personal protective gear, make sure they have a properly set up isolation unit and all that. And then the processes that are involved, even when you have a suspicious case are not clear at the moment. They need to be further clarified. For instance, if uh, uh, a suspicious case turns up in uh, one of the private hospitals, the protocols as to what to do, where to refer, how to collect samples, where to send the samples, all these things are not too clearly defined at the moment, and they need to be. Minister, can you respond to that? <coughs> Because we are working according to the strategy. We have public health experts, we have epidemiologists, and we have studied the scenario. We know the weaknesses of our country. So from day one, we are focused on prevention, early detection. And the risk assessment tells us that we are likely to have any case coming through an airport. So we strengthen the first line of defense. Uh, that is, we were one of the first countries to start real full screening of incoming passengers, uh, taking travel history, and we know where, which countries you visited in the previous 14 days. And uh, we had a case of someone who came in from China, and they had to be tracked down. So we have done that very diligently. If you imagine that one patient, one patient comes with coronavirus, imagine that he infects 15 others, imagine, in a day, and he's not detected. And those 15 infect 15 others in a day and they are not detected. And then again it goes on like that until the third or fourth generation is detected Then you can see why the numbers expand. Now, the index case that came in, the Italian man, immediately was discovered. Within 48 hours we had a diagnosis. We had him already in an IDH. All the contracts were traced and it ended with that one fast action, very quick. I commended the Lagos uh, team and I commended the Center for Disease Control for that. And the WHO also commended that. So all the cases we have now are new ones. They are all new imports. They are not uh, originating from the first one. 
and that's the situation that every country faces. You have several imports, and there are reports going on now that uh, even China is getting re-imports. And uh, it's, a, it's a nightmare because uh, the re-imports come in uh, with no symptoms. And if you want to test all people coming in, like some countries have had, South Korea, for example, found that testing everybody will not work. Even the United States tried that too. So every country is trying to find out what works for it, what works best for you, and uh, what you can also afford. You must also remember that a lot of this equipment we have to procure. We do not manufacture. The United States manufactures nearly everything, and they can ask for the industry to step up quickly. We have to go and procure. And we are doing that, trying to imagine what we need, what we need most urgently, and what we need to get uh, very quickly. Uh, that is why, again, banning all flights is, can have a little problem, in that if you are able, not able to bring any things you need, you might have a little constraint. So we look at various scenarios which make us take the decisions that we take in the best interest of uh, what situation we find ourselves. Abimbola Silva said we might miss some cases. Every country can miss cases. Okay. And there is no country that is prepared the way people imagine because it's a new disease, it's a new virus, and uh, the behavior is not yet very well known. Uh, scientists are working on it. And every country will miss cases, but you try to reduce the number of cases you might miss. There are also studies that show that up to 80% of infected cases may have little or no symptoms at all, absolutely zero. So that's why the disease is so dangerous. It's uh, spreading very rapidly. But we always believe that we must compensate for our weaknesses while we are strengthening our health system. And every country which has suffered so far is because their health system was overwhelmed, whether it's Italy or Spain or whatever, they're overwhelmed, uh, and China. So we are trying to strengthen our health systems, but well, at the same time, work on prevention. Well, uh, Honorable Minister, uh, Dr. Otabo and Dr. Babalola raised some very pertinent, <coughs> excuse me, raised some very pertinent uh, uh, issues. First, I give kudos to the Federal Ministry of Health, uh, some state ministries uh, of health, as well as, of course, the NCDC for the measures that they have taken so far. But the NCDC is not a hospital. The Federal Ministry of Health, per se, is not a hospital. And uh, if the preventive measures uh, get breached in some cases, then the patients would most likely end up with them. You know, they are all private uh, sector practitioners because uh, people patronize private healthcare uh, facilities, plus, of course, government healthcare facilities. And that's why they are raising some of these concerns they have raised. And I would like you to address those concerns. I mean, Dr. Babalola was talking about testing criteria being too strict. And then uh, also not uh, uh, private health care uh, givers not knowing the protocols uh, to adopt or okay. to follow. Well, in the first place, uh, meetings have been held with private practitioners. And the main message is recognize the index of, have an index of suspicion. And we commended the doctor in Abel Kuta who saw the index case that came in here. Uh, he looked, I believe he did a malaria test, it wasn't convinced, so immediately he referred the patient. Now, uh, we want all private practitioners, if you don't have the facilities to manage a case that you suspect, send them on. Don't hold on to, the longer you hold on to that patient, the greater the problem will be. So if you send them on immediately, as the doctor did in Abelkuta, you can have very good results. It helped us very much to be able to limit the time frame within which that index per, uh, person could have infected more people. So that helps us, and the message again to private practitioners, once you are not sure, refer. You might not have the facilities to treat. We know that most patients who need medical attention go to a private hospital. If you are suspicious, send that patient on. That's the best you can do. There's a call number that has been, that has been uh, disseminated uh, many times, uh, 0800. Nine seven zero 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 zero. Can and we take that again? Zero eight zero zero nine seven zero 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 zero. It's relatively simple. Yes. So it's a number you call and you get help. It has been, and I use this opportunity to disseminate it again. The number you call, you tell you exactly what to do. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, I believe that the guild should also spread it among themselves. Don't, don't try to hold on to a person too long if you are not sure. And they immediately call that number. They will tell you what to do. In fact, they will send a team to take a swab. 
and that is what they do. That's what happened in Lagos. The team comes to you, they take a swab, do a test, and then if the patient is positive, they come and pick him up from you. You, you, okay. know, you know, I'm sorry, I was just going to say, because yesterday again, I mean, we dwelt on this, uh, the metaphor of war is, is being used to describe uh, the response uh, by various countries to the uh, corona, uh, coronavirus pandemic. And, and part of, of the comments made by uh, Dr. Otabo and, and Babalola and indeed Abimbola refer to the fact that, okay, fine, you are having the preventive measures. Again, I would like to repeat this, you are having the preventive measures. Suppose there are breaches of those preventive measures and people slip into the larger population. They are ask, asking, for instance, say, look, on their own, they could support public health facilities by having what? The protective gear in the first instance, and then by having select hospitals uh, that will serve as isolation centers. I'm sure you've read about the, what was alleged to be the scandalous state in which the woman who was uh, suspected to have coronavirus uh, was kept, you know, in some dungeon somewhere in Enugu, uh, which the daughter claims probably aggravated her underlying circumstances. So they are calling for collaboration. Uh, say, have some select centers. It doesn't have to be the federal government. State governments could also take that. What's your reaction to this, Honorable Minister? My reaction is that even before the index case came in, we were already looking at isolation centers. I personally visited Lagos to check out the isolation center there. I visited a new, I mean, not a new Kano, checked out the isolation center. And I visited uh, Guagualada, where the isolation center is a standard one, was under construction. It started before this case came up. And that is the model we are going to use to replicate uh, isolation centers all over the country. But we, it takes time to get this working. So we have plan B, which means that we are using certain wards and certain wards of hospitals. And okay. uh, working with certain teaching hospitals to make rooms available in case there is an emergency or a spillover. Okay, Honorable Minister and our guest, we have a, a, bug, a report on the isolation centers and the numbers. I think we'll play it right now. When we return, the conversation continues. This is the Esut Colliery Hospital, said to be the isolation center in Enugu, where patients with suspected cases of coronavirus and other infectious diseases had to be isolated and quarantined. When NTA News crew visited the said isolation facility, they were denied access into the center, and efforts made to get the officials of the hospital to speak did not yield positive results. However, it was gathered from the letter making the rounds in the social media, purportedly written by the daughter of the woman suspected of the COVID-19 in Enugu, that upon her return to Nigeria from her visit to UK on Wednesday, 11th of March 2020, she exhibited some symptoms of the coronavirus and was taken to the hospital on the 13th of March, while her blood samples were collected on Saturday 14th and proved negative on the 15th of March. The good news is that the sample came back from the rural specialist hospital at the late hours of Sunday and uh, as it were, the result turned out to be negative. So the state at large, the emergency operations center, the Ministry of Health and the government of Enugu State are very, very happy with that development. But again, it has set the pace, at least to test the preparedness of the state, which we've seen that is very, very, very optimal. Even though the blood sample tested negative to COVID-19, the woman was said to have died, having been isolated in a dilapidated environment that seems to have been left uninhabitable over a long period of time. When NTA News crew put a call across to the Enugu State Commissioner for Information, as well as the Permanent Secretary, State Ministry of Health, they said the state government has summoned the management of the hospital to find out what actually happened and would brief the press on the outcome of the meeting. Also in the letter, the daughter of the said woman is asking why the Enugu state government had to wait until the news of the suspected case of the woman with COVID-19 before responding by releasing 20 million naira for the management of the state isolation center. The new strand of coronavirus was detected back in December 2019 and the state government had before now assured residents of Enugu that it has an isolation center that is optimally ready to deal with any case of coronavirus and other emergencies. They've uh, activated their own, you know, emergency operations center. The state government encouraged the residents to ensure the highest level of personal hygiene, especially the hand and respiratory hygiene. In Enugu, Chine Enwoye, NTN News.
so much concentration, as you can see from this report, on Abuja and Lagos. What is this level of synergy between the Ministry of Health, Federal Ministry of Health, and the State Government Ministry of Health? We work very well with the State Government. We pass messages on. Uh, as I told you just now, I visited Kano uh, Isolation Center. I went to look in there. And uh, I've seen the one in uh, Guagualada. That, that is even before the index case came in. And uh, Lagos, I inspected all these places. In, the, in fact, Lagos is also being a brand isolation center. But the part of the isolation center is that we are beginning to change the tactic. You don't build an isolation center far away somewhere. In those days when you had smallpox and all these kinds of uh, diseases which you have to keep people away, uh, you had them um, somewhere where they fall into disuse because it's not every day you have uh, these uh, kinds of epidemics. Now, we're looking at, uh, like you have in, Enugu, in um, uh, Guagualada, the isolation center in a teaching hospital. It can be, in fact, used for anything else, but the day you need it, you vacate it and then uh, prepare it for uh, use. Uh, and, and, and it's ready and in good shape at any time. So in many states, there are places where they have isolation centers. In fact, there are active isolation centers that I speak to you for TB and various other but you can't put uh, all infected cases together. In uh, Iroa, they have one of the very best isolation centers for Lhasa. But uh, if you have an all-purpose uh, uh, isolation center, which I think every state should have uh, and, and make it ready, they should be inside the facility that is able to provide the services that you need, where it can be uh, properly maintained and kept ready at any time. So it is true that uh, some like in Enuguna may at a point have fallen into disuse. I haven't been there. But uh, trying to activate it is uh, probably a challenge. And I believe that most countries, most countries fall into this same kind of problem. All right, uh, Dr. Abin Bola Silva, let's, let's have your take on this. I mean, what, what information are you getting from, from your colleagues uh, elsewhere in, in the country in terms of level of preparedness and what concerns they have uh, or what has been done right? Thank you very much for that question. When the NCDC came to give elect, uh, training to the Guild of Medical Directors in Abuja and in Lagos, we were instructed that our main duty is to try and screen isolate and then not notify. Now, once we notify and the, you know, the criteria is checked and they uh, agree to come, I mean, and they think the patient should be tested, NCDC will come to your center and collect the sample of the patient and then wait for 48 hours at least to get the results out. Now, if you think about the logistics of all of, of this, you should be able to safely screen you should be able to isolate wherever the patient has come to you and then wait, keeping the patient still with you for, while we are waiting for the results to come out. What I'm getting, I'm just like my uh, prof and um, Dr. Tabo have said, the, the cent, you know, even the hospitals are not prepared to be able to, you know, be able to keep the patient while we are waiting for results. Because you, you are, that's what NCDC, NCDC asked us to do. Screen, isolate, and notify. And then wait for the results to come out. So you wait 48 hours, the patient is with you in that time. And then when the confirmation is, when the patient, if the confirmation is there, then NCDC will come and pick the patient from you. But in 48 hours, you have to be able to still contain the patient within your premises somehow. Um, I'm, we have been, I mean, we have been told now that we should refer Nobody really knows how to treat coronavirus now. I mean, since there's no treatment, it's mainly supportive care. So, if we are we are we just like Professor Professor said, are we to screen, isolate, and refer immediately, or in those 48 hours, something still has to happen to ensure that patient doesn't infect anybody else, staff in the hospital, other patients coming for treatment who don't have coronavirus. You know, at that, that period. So this is why we're saying that if everybody knows that there's a safe isolation place, for example, now I think Guagalada is what we know of the isolation center. I know some of my colleagues are sending patients to Guagalada. Imagine sending a, a patient has come to you, you suspect this is a problem, and you refer them to Guagalada. Some of these patients make a stopover at home and plan to go to Guagalada the next day or the day after, and along the line, 
still may still infect some people if if all of this is if i'm just painting yeah that was scenario sketching scenarios, yes. scenarios you know yeah. so if before they eventually get to Gogolada by themselves. They may delay and go to Gogolada in three or four, five days or six days, and then they would have done a bit of spreading before they eventually get there. So I'm just wondering, just like Prof has such, you know, as, and like you have also said, if there was an isolation place, and just like um, the Honorable Minister also said, isolation place that we all know about within the city that you can immediately say, okay, let's isolate you there while we are waiting for results to come out, especially because you're a suspect, I think that may help us more. <laughs> Dr. Otaba, what does this do to practice? <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, uh, coronavirus is, is an emerging thing and it's, it, things change rapidly under this pandemic. And we have to keep pace and in fact be ahead of the virus for us to save as many lives as possible. We must um, anticipate the problems and plan to solve them before they come. For instance, the US uh, president approved the release of two hospital ships to treat normal patients because the system is overwhelmed such that the normal hospitals are being taken over by coronavirus patients. It might get to that situation very soon, maybe in a couple of weeks, God forbid, but we should also think about it. That by the time you are having 2,000 patients coronavirus all over the place, I mean, the normal hospital setting will be overwhelmed. What is the plan in this sick circumstance? It's good to prevent, and we are doing everything to prevent, thanks to the federal government for banning the flights and all that. But something tells me that the, 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 the preventive measures have been breached, and the, the problem is with us right now. What do we do? Uh, we, every one of us here, we are consultants and specialists in our own right. We are also involved in private practice. We, we are not convinced that we are ready. I think that the federal government should engage stakeholders beyond just you know, talking about what NCDC is doing and trying to prevent. Call the people who would be seeing the patients face to face and ask, what is your capacity? What do you need? What do you anticipate will be the problem? So we, we, put, we come together and discuss. And then we paint case scenarios. That's what we should be doing. But just to think of prevention, we have passed that level. That's the truth. Because cases are coming. And by the time you have two people infecting themselves within the community, then you know that the time is up. They said the best time to have planted the tree was 20 years ago, but the next best time is now. Who are the stakeholders you have in mind? Now, the private hospitals, the government hospitals, the medical, the laboratory centers, the every, all those who are involved in caring for patients. For instance, how many, how many um, um, uh, intensivists do we have? Because when it happens, you have people quickly coming down with respiratory distress and they need to be supported you know, to go over that phase before they recover. So how many people can we put on ventilator at this time, T? Let's say in Abuja of about 5 million people. I'm not sure that we can have more than 100 people on ventilators in this Abuja at any given time. But there could be a situation where you need, you will have like seven to 1,000, 700 to 1,000 people requiring ventilator care. So what that means is that all those people will just be condemned to die. Well, well I'm just, I'm just wondering. I mean, this is uh, we're sketching a scenario of crisis. We, are, we aren't there yet, but as you said, it's useful to plan. You know, ahead just in case uh, the dam breaks. That What's, what's your take on this? The Honorable Minister has already responded to some of the issues that you raised. What further concerns uh, do you have which you would like addressed? Well, basically, uh, I've always called for better collaboration between you know, the private sector and the you know, ministries of health, both at the federal level and at the state uh, level. And I've always said that uh, the Minister of Health is a minister not just for the you know, federal tertiary hospitals, but for all private hospitals in the country. Um, if you look at um, the scenario in the UK, for instance, um, private uh, 
hospitals or private surgeries, as they call it in the UK, are closely integrated with the overall healthcare you know, practice in the country. So that, by definition, your first line of call as a patient living anywhere in the country is your GP next door, and not the teaching hospital or the, I mean, tertiary hospital. The tertiary hospitals take cases from you only when you cannot cope. And this is what we are, you know, agitating for in the country as well. I believe that this um, coronavirus issue has just uh, sort of uh, further highlighted the need for better collaboration. You know, we have been calling for meetings with the, Fed with the Federal Minister of Health, but he has been a bit uh, busy. I, I, I hope that he will eventually find time to meet with the private uh, hospitals. But just like uh, Dr. Otabo is saying, um, unless we have that synergy, we're not going to be able to cope with this problem. Like I said, the likelihood that the, the cases will come to a private hospital are much higher than doing to a teaching hospital. The cases will come to us first. We don't have information. We don't have uh, all these things that we need to, to cope with this, uh, with this situation. Just, uh, the reason why I brought uh, Dr. Bimbo to, to be with us today is because she was the person who organized our meeting with the NCDC. It was, she was the one who pushed for it, for us to have those meetings. And I also, incidentally, one of the NCDC people uh, is a member of my church, and I you know, impressed on her that there was a need for you to train, I mean, uh, private uh, practitioners, both in Abuja and Lagos, before the, that meeting held. And as far as we are concerned in the Guild of Medical Directors, Bimbo that you are seeing there is our expert. She's the one who knows. She's the one who has collaborated with the NCDC. And you can hear what she's saying. The scenario that they give her is that <clears throat> patients come, they are isolated, you know. So we have to have the means to isolate in our, in our facilities. And what I'm trying to say here is that not every hospital can develop that capacity to build isolation centers. You understand? Uh, because the capacity of private hospitals varies. Some are stronger than others. And this is why I was saying that, okay, uh, let us look for some hospitals, maybe on the advice of the Guild of Medical Directors, that we say, okay, these hospitals have the capacity to build or to construct isolation centers, either by themselves or with aid from the federal government. You know, and then the Minister of Health knows that, okay, apart from Gwagwalada, you know, there are some other hospitals, you know, within the city to which if Dr. Otabo sees a case in his hospital, for instance, he can say, okay, I'm suspecting that this case has, this patient has COVID-19. Let me send to the hospital that is designated to isolate while the testing is being done. The issue of treatment is another thing. Of course, and this is where I think the teaching hospitals will then come in because uh, the ability to teach, to treat, to put on ventilators and so on and so forth may be beyond the capacity of some of the hospitals, so private hospitals, but certainly, you know, the teaching hospitals may be, be able to build that capacity. Okay. So, um, no, continue. So, this is why I'm thinking that we, sh we should be begin to think along those lines, you know, so that. Uh, if it should come to, I mean, like uh, Dr. Otabo was saying, if we suddenly have 2,000 cases in Nigeria, we're not going to be able to cope as it is. So, but uh, if all our energies are harnessed, whether they're in the private or in the you know, federal uh, government or state government uh, side, then I think uh, together we can all work together to uh, handle I, I this hope, crisis. Dr. Babalala, you're not having an elitist view of this. No, I mean, I'm, I'm just wondering, before Jumai mm. add, pops the next question to mm. the Honorable Minister of Health, we keep referring to Abuja and Lagos. Nigeria's population is spread all across. Mm. I mean, so, that it, so, so that it doesn't become a case like some of the cancer 
uh, treatment uh, facilities. That is, so only when you come to the national hospital that you can, uh, you know, have uh, cancer treatment. When that machine breaks down, uh, even was, that was, is not enough. Uh, yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's not enough. So let it not break it like it's only Abuja and Lagos. You have people elsewhere. So that uh, those who are watching us uh, from uh, Sokoto, Kano, Meduguri, uh, Jos, uh, Pangshin, uh, and other location, Mina, Mina is close by. Uh, you know, we we'll have a sense that uh, they are also yeah, being okay, discussed. Yeah. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah. You see, because to be honest. The spread of um, private facilities is the widest in the country. You understand? There's hardly any town you go to, or any village, or any city, moderate size, uh, big size, that you do not have private, uh, you know, hospitals there. And uh, uh, certainly, this is why I'm saying that once, you know, the uh, private hospitals are engaged at the national level, then we can then disseminate all this uh, information to our members and uh, we can work with them and see how they can fit in. We can feed them direct information as to, okay, if you do have uh, a suspicious case, maybe in uh, Kotangura or wherever your hospital is, this is what you are supposed to do. Because all our, all our members have been trying to, I mean, link up with those at the national uh, level and say, what do we do? when we have cases. I don't have the answer for them at the moment. Okay, Honorable Minister, you know, there's so much talk about equipment, isolation center, but the big question is the managers of this disease. Are we manpower equipped to handle it? Well, we can't answer that question without going back to what the private practitioners have said, okay. in that it, uh, quite apart from facilities and space, you need expertise. If you do not have the trained nurses, the trained doctors, no private practitioner should be thinking of managing a case like that. So the best thing you can do is consult. If you have the index of suspicion, refer. It has been said so many times. And as the saying goes, if you didn't hear the news, then there was no news. Uh, the uh, Bimbo just said just now that there was training here in, in Abuja and Lagos. Those are the two hubs where we really expect and the main airports. And Abuja and Lagos, there are other parts of the country. I know, but I've said already, mm that the main, these are, this is an imported problem, and the main airports are Abuja and Lagos. We know very well that it can spread to other areas, but secondarily, so the primary problems and the most of the traveling population will be in these two places. And events have proved us to be correct. Most of the testing is in these places. But what we expect of the private practice uh, uh, group is that once you have an index of suspicion, don't hold on sent to the one you know. There's a number, it's been disseminated every time. We hold a briefing three times a week with the press to so keep the public abreast of what's happening because knowledge is going to be part of uh, what we need to fight this disease and also fight ignorance and fight misinformation. But as far as the equipment is concerned, yes, our first line of defense is prevent. Secondly, detect and thirdly, handle. We have involved all the teaching hospitals. We have told them, make word, one word available at short notice. Be ready to do that. Get all your equipment functional. Secondly, we have received money, which we have had a shopping list. We have sent to equipment with uh, all that things. They have to come from outside the country. We don't manufacture most mm -hmm. things. Although we are making hand sanitizers now. The, um, an agency under the ministry is making hand sanitizers. So we are trying to prepare on every front. But we must use a strategy, rely on our public health experts. I'm a surgeon, I'm not a public health expert. So I'm on the phone every time with all the public health experts we have uh, who are running and those with hands-on experience. To you see know, how we tweak the situation, uh, our response to the situation as it arises, I, I, I was, was correct. It's changing all the time. Yeah, I was wondering, just you know, so that gentlemen, again, this is uh, something that we often refer to. I mean, this, the federal government is taking the lead in this. W w what has the uh, National Council on Health done uh, with respect to uh, cascading this down to the subnational levels? Here, we're talking about you know, commissioners for health and what they're doing. We keep here, we've read one or two stories of a state government setting up a committee and giving them 10 million you know, to go and do some things. I, I, I don't know. This, what, what are you getting from... Uh, Every state has an EOC emergency operating center, which connects with the state ministry of health and the state public health department, and they work with them. The case that came in, the index case that came in here, 
followed up very diligently all tracked all the people who were the aircraft, all the people they had contact with, 19 of them in Lagos, and uh, I think 39 or 40 in Ogun State. That's where he came for his consultancy. Had Does he include the, the crew of the ship, um, of, the, of, the, of the plane, the no, pilot, the, the, and the crew? No, no, the, the plane has gone back to Turkey, but again, it, what the public health department does is to send the airline and the embassy uh, a notice and say, look, this plane came with someone who had uh, coronavirus. Do the need to. They know what to do. Public health advice system. Disinfect the plane. Uh, look after the crew. On our own here, those travelers who left back to other countries were detected and their embassies were informed. But those of us, those of them who were here in Nigeria, they were tracked and found. Some of them were in different states, mm -hmm. in Edo and so on. They were tracked, they were put under the care of the state. Uh, public health department and observed for the 14 days that uh, was required. Mm -hmm. Now, the private practitioner who saw that in this case did exactly the right thing, referred him immediately, didn't hold on, didn't say, well, let me try this, let me try that. So, and that one saved the situation. We commended him for that already. And then the result usually comes out within six hours, not 48 hours. Six hours you can get your result. And even if you need to repeat it, you can repeat it in 48 hours, but you get a result very rapidly. Mm. What we do in between is a matter of design. We're trying to design what we do, how we respond. We know that the first part of call will probably be a private hospital. Mm. And our advice is try to call the number if you suspect. Call the number. It has been done. Many people are doing that. <coughs> Just last night, I got a text from Guagualada that uh, they had four patients being tested. You know, they are referred from private hospitals. Private okay, hospitals. Boom, yeah. so we have you know, you know, you know yes. with its, uh, well, it's an issue that will keep coming up, uh, coming back to. The central bank has already announced uh, a grant or a loan. I'm not sure how it is categorized of a hundred billion era. It's a hundred billion era intervention for this. How would you like to see that money spent? Whose question? Yeah. Yes. Okay. In terms of healthcare. Yes. Yeah. It's, there are so many fronts. Uh, I listened to the uh, CBN governor talk about it. Uh, there's, the, the fund is for expansion of uh, private hospital facilities. Because whether you like it or not, um, the private hospital is the cornerstone of healthcare in Nigeria at the moment. The, pri the teaching hospitals, they have their role to play. But more patients go to the private hospitals. Um, if we are going to be effective in the treatment, not prevention of uh, coronavirus, the private hospitals will have to be involved in the treatment. It's, it's not about um, testing and sending. I, I, I beg to disagree with the Honorable Minister a little bit on this, because I know the capacities of the teaching hospitals. Some of them don't even have two ventilators. And there are private hospitals who have as many as six ventilators and doing big things. Th this is the collaboration I'm talking about. It's beyond saying sent to uh, teaching hospitals. Many of the patients, if they send them to the teaching hospitals, we cannot guarantee what will happen to them because the capacity is not there as it were. So we need the collaboration all, on all fronts. So if the CBN is making funds available for this purpose, it's talk, they are talking about the private hospitals. Private hospitals can acquire more uh, space, build more structures, equip, and then be ready for the battle. So I think that this is the way to go. If, if it was to the government hospital, I'm, I'm sure the CBN governor would not be talking about the grant. It's to the private hospital. They should make the process of, of getting these funds um, uh, easy so that private hospital can ac acquire the funds and make be ready to 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 take on some of the challenges that will come from this pandemic okay thank you so much we have a number of tweets nigerians are contributing to the conversation we'll take it quickly a mobile on babs tweets better late than never the travel restriction from high risk countries and unofficial purposes is a welcome development. However, government should go beyond advocacy. Those who came in into the country in the last two weeks and may have likely been exposed to risks shouldn't be traced and monitored. All right, uh, we have others. Festa Sakimboy, Wadele, Jack Solomon, Mike Kayak, War, uh, these uh, 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 regulars, Ibrahim Oduaji also has a tweet here. Uh, 
It's that's by a mode wide. Let me read this uh, very quickly. It says uh, Nigeria needs to shut down other airports with the exception of Abuja and Lagos unless have quarantine centers where travelers coming from pandemic countries will be directly quarantined instead of self isolation. Yes, and um, we have Steve Bond, 007 Abdul, and it takes Sagir Abatukur. Generally speaking, I expect the federal government to take drastic measures on COVID-19 since day one by closing its borders for the well-being of Nigerians. Though it is not too late, the federal government must work tirelessly to ensure the safety of all Nigerians. I think that's about the number of tweets we can take. Now, right. Kisley. All right, yeah. So that's, uh, we'd like to thank you, Cecilia Akuruma and Umar and others for your tweets. We have a second topic, by the way, and so that's why we're having at this time to thank uh, all our guests uh, who have been with us in this conversation. Dr. Abim Bola Siva, she's a member of the Guild of Medical Directors. Uh, thank you for being with us on Good Morning Nigeria today. Thank you. We also would like to appreciate uh, Dr. Fabi Babalola, who is President of the Guild of Medical Directors. Thanks for being on Good Morning Nigeria. Thank Dr. Dr. Christopher Otabo, uh, also a member of the Guild of uh, Directors and a consultant of the Medic Surgeon. Thanks for being with us on Good Morning Nigeria today. Dr. Osage Anere, uh, also a surgeon, uh, Honorable Minister of Health. Thank you for being with us on Good Morning Nigeria. You have any closing you. thoughts? Well, closing thoughts again are the same thing I said before. All right. Managing a case like that, you see, we don't even manage them at the teaching hospitals. We manage them in an infectious disease hospital where there's a protocol set in Lagos. They don't, they don't go to Luth or anywhere else. And I would not advise any private practitioner who doesn't have the full, even if you have the space, you don't have the complement of staff to try that. You, have, you run the risk of running, of infecting other patients and infecting uh, staff if you do not have the full complement and a protocol. All right, Minister, thank you for being with us. It's Good Morning Nigeria still, reaching you live on the network service of the Nigerian Television Authority. We'll take a short break now. When we return, we'll be discussing... The slash in the pump price of petrol, now 125 Naira, down from 145. Come back and uh, good morning, Nigeria. We uh, indicated earlier that uh, sequel to the global uh, fall in oil price due to coronavirus and, of course, the spat uh, between Saudi Arabia and Russia. Uh, President Mohamed Buhari has approved the immediate reduction in the pump price of petrol from 145 Naira per litre to 125 Naira per litre. Of course, this information came yesterday at uh, the end of uh, the Federal Executive Council meeting. Here with us in the studios to uh, discuss this issue and matters arising there from, let's welcome our regular guest, Ni Akinsi Ju. Ni Akinsi, of course, an investment and financial analyst. Ni, delighted to have yeah, you. Pleasure, always. Thank Thank you so much. Also here with us in the studios is uh, Amina Mena. She is uh, the Group Chief Operating Officer of MRS Holdings. That's a business in the oil and gas sector. I mean, a pleasure to have you with us on the program. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Yes, um, you know, the, just yesterday, Nigerians woke up to the, you know, presidential order that, um, you know, the PMS money to be paid when you buy petroleum has been reduced by the federal government. How are you, how are you going to comply with that? Um, well, I mean, first of all, it's a welcome development because I think that with international prices crashing, it was inevitable that the petroleum price would also crash. Um, we've been directed and told that the pump price should be adjusted from today, and naturally we will comply. It's not even something that... But I think that people need to understand that there's a process to changing the pump price because it's not the people who are in the stations that can just go and adjust the meters, but all the technicians are out already. We've directed everyone go out and start to do what you need to do. But we have to send engineers who can go out and make those adjustments as needed. So you will start to see those changes today. Um, and we're going to meet with government later on in the day to understand fully how this implementation will be done and how fast, because I think your colleague mentioned earlier on the program that people already hold stock in their facility, which we had priced at higher prices. But we're not concerned about that right now. Our concern is really ensuring that what government has asked us to do is done. And we know that government is considerate, and I've always kept their word that we'll be able to work out the modalities as to how we cushion whatever mm -hmm. losses we may have. All right, thanks a lot, uh, I mean, I mean, uh, uh, Nii. Yeah, I think, uh, <clears throat> 
for me, it is is about opportunity cost. You know, uh, because the the government had a choice in the face of uh, uh, projected, of course, dwindling uh, revenue and all that, not to change the price. You know, the uh, the pump price of PMS because really, uh, we've we've had a subsidy uh, regime. Well, what we have in now, of course, is decline the price of uh, of uh, crude oil, reflecting. You know, on uh, on landing cost and all that, the government could have said, "It's time since we are going to lose so much from crude oil uh, face value. Let us use the extra, you know, that we can save as as income for for the federation. So by reducing uh, the 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 co the pump price, it is to say that we are also sacrificing this much for Nigerians. And I think it has to do with uh, creating the comfort, you know, comfort regime for Nigerians. It is proactive. In the reasons of it, we've not been hit, you know, by the perhaps until yesterday when these uh, 13 countries were bad from coming in. We've, we, we have not been hit by the consequences of coronavirus. So I, I think creating this, uh, this comfort environment is, uh, is a way of empowering Nigerian households going forward. Because this will reflect in transportation costs, it will reflect in logistics for companies, it will reflect in enhanced uh, demand capacity for households and all that. And I said, a 20 naira difference goes a long way, especially when you start multiplying by, by weeks and months. You know, if you, are, if you use 10 liters a day of a PMS and you are saving uh, like 200 naira, you know, across, across 10 days, that is 2,000 naira. Across 30 days, that is 6,000 naira. And you can go on and on. And what, what it does is that you are saving money on PMS to buy things, you know. And as, of course, as we also look, you know, at uh, possible cases of depression in terms of demand, savings like this, because they are truly savings, savings like these are, the, are those uh, elements that will help our demand push, as it were. So I, I, I think it's good as we create that comfort regime for Nigerians as a whole. Is it, uh, let's, let's get this clear, I mean, uh, well, we're not, the numbers haven't been fully disaggregated, at least from the reports that I, I have read since the announcement came yesterday first with the speculation as to what the actual slash would be. Uh, does this now amount to uh, an end as, uh, of, of the subsidy regime or uh, under recovery of cost? Is, is that what we are seeing? I, I, I don't think it's an end to subsidy regime because what the minister said specifically was modulation. And of course, we know who introduced <laughs> that. Uh, price modulation. <laughs> you know, so it's, it's price modulation. Uh, you modulate a long movement of price of crude oil, the basic, uh, the basic product, as it were. So all, I think all other elements in the pricing templates are constant. You know, uh, the, the, the difference would just be the price of crude oil in, in, uh, in the international market. So I, I don't think it's about the removal of subsidy, because if you also extend it uh, by what the government is also doing in reviewing the budget 2020, uh, the, the money set aside in the budget for uh, recovery, for under recovery, is also slashed, is also reduced, you know, in that review. So I think basically it's also target you know, that's under recovery and also use it again as a floor, you know, for, for the review as it were. I, I don't know, you're, you're, we're suddenly rather optimistic that uh, transport fares will be slashed, but we know, we do that with respect to uh, uh, transport operators, I'm not saying this to malign you, but we know that there are profiteers all over the place. Yes. It is, uh, you know, it will be difficult for them to reduce uh, their fares and they will tell you that, you know, the fuel I bought, you know, is uh, 145, <laughs> that is one, and it goes on and on and on and on, and mm. even if they are going to slash, uh, it will not be by any sufficient margin. Whereas if the price went up to say 150 naira this morning, mm -hmm. the price would have doubled. Just by, you know. just by five naira. Uh, yes, so uh, why, are you, why are you optimistic, uh, or what needs to be done? I mean, that's, that's the most yeah. pertinent question. Yeah. What needs to be done to uh, engage, you know, uh, uh, transport uh, uh, owners and, and transport operators uh, to take a cue from this and then uh, have uh, a knock-on effect in terms of the fares that they charge? Uh, just as uh, Chief Yair had said, uh, there's going to be further consultation with 
petroleum products market as, as it were. And I think at the level of transporters, you have two major uh, union or association of transporters, the North W, National Union of Road Transport Workers, and the Road Transporters Employers Association or something. Yeah, NATO. NATO. So you expect that there will be a form of consultation at different levels from the federal government to the state government and all that. And I have also been observing a kind of collaboration, really, a kind of engagement between these associations and, uh, I mean, this union, mm -hmm. and of course the, uh, the government at different levels. So I, the, the important thing is for government to be committed for a reflection, you know, of this policy on the Nigerian people. And in doing that, you need to actually consult uh, these unions, as it were. Uh, you know, the, the economy has been hit hard already, and um, it's good news for Nigerians that the poor price has been reduced. But how will it impact the economy now? Well, I mean, to start with, like he mentioned, the issue of under-recovery. Um, as you know, there's been an amount in the budget for this year for the under-recovery that amount will no longer be budgeted for because the prices have come down to a point where you don't really need the under-recovery. So that translates automatically to a saving. If I remember correctly, I think it's a trillion naira or something like that yes. in the budget. Mm -hmm. So that means that we do have a trillion naira available now for other critical areas that government needs to look into. Additionally, it may take a while, but like he's pointed out, road transportation, which drives the prices of everything. If you go to the market, the market woman will tell you, oh, you know, the cost of transport is high, so that's why my goods are expensive. But you're going to see all of that reduce. You're going to see a situation where with the crude prices today, and hopefully it remains this way for some time, the entire industry, the oil industry in itself, will come back on stream. You're not going to have NNPC as the sole importers anymore. You will now have private sector participation which then translates into job creations for other people. You know, people will be able to start to work again. And by doing that, at least we're adding to the economy because you have people who are being employed. Whatever they earn at the end of the day would go back into the economy and will hopefully start to see things turn around again. I, I, I'll come back to, uh, you know, getting more uh, importers into the mix. But one very urgent question to ask is, Okay, this is the decision that the government has taken with regard to PMS, which stands for Premium Motor Spirit, also known as petrol. What is the effect of the crash in crude oil prices on the price of diesel, AGO, automotive gas oil? So if you take diesel, for example, because that's fully deregulated, mm -hmm. you will find that starting from last week, actually, most private um, depots had reduced their prices because that is a product that is not regulated or there's no under recovery. So you see that um, sort of automatic reduction because the product is priced in line with the market. Now with PMS, because it is modulated, there's a level to which you can go. You can't just get up and say, I'm going to go and import. When you look at the template, there are elements in the template that are really, com uh, that are really controlled by government. So as private sector people, we can't just get up and decide, well, I'm going to import without knowing how I'm going to recover my cost. Whereas with diesel, you don't have that. So you would see from the market that from last week, diesel prices had crashed already. So what, what numbers are we looking at? For diesel? Yeah, for diesel. Um, <coughs> today, I think diesel is selling in the range, at least X depot. I'm not sure what the stations are doing, but X depot, you have prices have come down to about 170 naira per litre. Whereas before all of this, we were looking at a range of anywhere between 190 to 200 naira per litre. So you can see that already. And as long as the prices continue to drop, you will continue to see the price drop also. That's good news for business owners. But the, the announcement yesterday, did it come as a shock to private marketers? To be honest, I mean, personally, I was not shocked. I can't speak for everyone because this is a responsible government. Right, and we knew that it was going to come. Government is responsive, government is considerate. As long as prices drop, you need to see that also translate into the lives of the ordinary man. So, if it didn't come yesterday, it probably would have come today, but it was definitely something we were expecting. Well, always a contentious point is uh, oh, <clears throat> excuse me, oh, the uh, pricing regime, you know. 
uh, investors are not uh, confident when there is a cap, when the system is not deregulated. But we have seen this being uh, acted out now with a drop in crude oil prices. Okay, the government is selling slash petrol to one, uh, one, uh, 125, and there's still a reasonable margin. And you were, I mean, are talking about oh, opportunity for more importers to come. When are we going to see investment in refineries from the private sector? To be honest, I think that's a policy issue, and it's a very delicate issue, so to say. No marketer would say that I'm going to make an investment when I'm not sure of the policies that govern my investment. So you will start to see that when the, basically the forces of demand and supply determine prices. Petrol is something that is very sensitive to nearly every Nigerian. If government woke up today and said, well, we're going to stop the price modulation and just allow everybody to import like they do with diesel, Nigerians will kick back and say, oh, but we're a country that produces oil, why are we not refining? But then the flip side of it is that no investor wants to go, you're going to take a loan from a bank. You need to know how you're going to recover that money because when the time comes, the bank is not going to say, oh, well, there was a regulation by government which, allowed, which stopped you from selling to recover your cost. So until we get to that point where Nigerians actually believe that government is doing everything possible for us as a nation and allow government to focus on things like regulation, maybe with the passing of the PIB, we would see you know, more enabling environment. In, in other words, food bringing. deregulation. That's, that's, that's the bottom line of what you are saying. Yes. Ni. Uh, 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 Very I, I, I think uh, the Dango Toy <laughs> refinery <laughs> had, uh, had given us a new prism you know, to look at this issue. Uh, we, we, we are going to have the, la the biggest refinery you know, in, in, in Africa. And uh, perhaps more than that, my argument against uh, this uh, logic is that PMS is not the only product <laughs> of uh, crude. You know, you have so many byproducts. Uh, I think these byproducts are also as profitable as PMS. And it's there, there should be enough motivation, actually, to have private investors, you know, uh, investing in refineries in the country. Okay, thank you, Ni Akisiju, investment and financial expert. Thank you, for, as usual, for your input. My and uh, Amina so Maina from the oil and gas sector group. Chief Operating Officer, MRS Holdings. Thank you so much Thanks, for coming on Good Morning Nigeria. Well, Kinsley? All right, so that does it for us today on Good Morning Nigeria. We thank you for being. Uh, and to us, tomorrow we return same time, 7 o'clock in the morning. Until then, we'll enjoy the rest of your day. I'm Kingsley Osadolo. And I'm Juma Yusuf. Have a great day. <laughs>